Ah, the cover is so pretty. Content's pretty good as well. Hey folks, I'm going to give you a brief rundown on what's inside the book, what I like, what I didn't care about, and whether or not you should grab a copy. First, we have a system for character origin. I love anything that allows you to play a little looser with the rules. Now, if you have a character who's an elf, you don't need to follow just the skills and ability scores written in the player's handbook. Some may complain that this makes character race irrelevant. Well, mechanically, it does. But you still get the flavor. You can still use the standard bonuses and skills written in the player's handbook, but this gives you the explicit freedom for the player to do whatever they want. So for players like mine, who want to make unusual combinations, this is a blessing. It's like the olive branch to the power gamer, so they feel like they can get the style of character that they want as well, not just pick for the optimal character build. After that, we get some new options for character classes. Now, some of these have been in earlier forms in the mythic odysseys of Theros or Eberron rising from the last war. Full disclosure, I don't buy every single book that Wizards of the Coast releases for D&D. And if you're watching this review, I have a feeling neither do you. Um, otherwise, you're buying this book regardless. I'm also not a big fan of Unearthed Arcana. UA, to me, is a lot of great ideas, but many times the actual mechanics of these things are broken and not fully playtested. If you're running multiple games a week with new characters being created constantly, then it makes sense for you to flavor up your games with these cool options. But for gamers who meet maybe once a week with campaigns that can last months or years like mine, you don't necessarily have the changeover required to really utilize UA with the new character each week or month. In that sense, Tasha's character class options are very valuable. So this book provides an entirely new class previously introduced in Eberron with new options that have been playtested and are now balanced. Among the highlights for the Artificer class, a lot of noise has been made towards the Armorer subclass, and with good reason. It's a magical medieval Iron Man suit, and if that doesn't get you excited, I'm not really sure what will. The ability to switch the armor from Infiltrator mode to Guardian mode really makes this a wonderfully versatile class. The Artillerist is another interesting choice. They get to create the Eldritch Cannon. It's basically a gunslinger type for a medieval D&D setting. I can see where this would clash with the basic ideas of a lot of people's D&D settings, but it's nice to have the option. One thing that I see can be an issue for new DMs especially is how do you give magic items to an artillerist? It's a magical weapon by itself, but new DMs may have an issue as magic swords are meaningless to this character. Now I have a solution which I utilize in my own campaigns, and I'll talk about that in an upcoming video where I discuss how I deal with magical weapons. Lastly, there's the Battlesmith. While this doesn't really translate into my personal style of play, I know players who immediately gravitate to the Steel Defender. The idea of having a familiar just rings true to some of these players, and they'll love that Battlesmith. It's like a pet robot monster. I mean, that just sounds fun by itself. Some other highlights of the subclasses I saw were the Twilight Domain Cleric. It seems like a cleric that would be right at home in an Assassin's Guild. Now, personally, I love that idea. Then there's the Psy Warrior. The Psy Warriors are basically Jedi, and they're totally showing up in my next campaign. It's nice to see that the Ranger gets some perks that make it feel a little bit more rangery. I especially like the Swarm Keeper. Seems to hit that correct note in between Druid and Fighter that the Ranger is trying to hit. Now, the amount of great options that you can use in your game is just fantastic. Now, your mileage may vary, but the options here are balanced and function well for players who love both theme and power gaming. Chapter 2 covers what may be my favorite subject in the entire book, Group Patrons. Now, this is a staple in my games. Adventurers in my style of game always work for the powerful in the world. The group eventually makes decisions that will alter the political landscape of the countries they are in. They start as little vermin hunters and end up literal kingmakers. So group patrons from my personal style of play, fantastic. I love everything about this chapter. It gives you eight example patrons that you can use, subcategories within, and the mechanical benefits to your party for working with this type of patron. It even has adventure ideas related to the specific type of patron that you can utilize in your campaigns. Pure gold content in this chapter. This is going into my game right now, like this week. Now the last section is a short blurb about running your own faction and being a patron. This is the only part that's a little weak. The new spells on offer are also great additions. I do love the increased number of summoning spells. I have some players in my campaigns who love the idea of controlling minions. 
this book with these spells, the Swarm Keeper, the Battlesmith, all put together, seems to scratch that itch. I love the idea of magical tattoos, especially if you're running a non-European game setting. This can add a lot of flavor. Many countries around the world use tattoos as sort of symbolic artwork. Imagine a culture where you don't make magical items at all, but the wizards give magical tattoos instead. I mean, it just feels more personal than a plus one sword. It becomes part of your character. To me, it adds a narrative gravitas to gaining a magical item. Imagine finding the specific tattoo symbols that grant this arcane power, and then finding a specialized tattoo artist that can actually create this body art for you so that the character becomes one with the magic. Just fantastic. Included after that are some cool magical items. My personal favorites include Baba Yaga's Mortar and Pestle and the Crook of Rao. The reason I love these two so much is because they have random properties. I love the idea of named magical items being specific to your world. My hand and I and Vecna are different than yours. Different items, different universes. And to see that translate into these two items is fantastic. Lastly, there's a section on Dungeon Master Tools. I love that this is there in the rulebook. Actual sections discussing a session zero or the social contract in a game. I also like hard and soft limits. I know that sounds a little woke or PC stuff to some people, but as a person who games with strangers, I like being clear about that sort of thing. In my family game, I know the people in there. I know what their limits are. Outside of that, though, I set very clear hard and soft limits of things that will be in the game. Like, for instance, I have a hard rule that there is no sexual violence in my games. I don't include it in my games, nor do I allow it from my players. Moving on to what else is included in the DM tools, you can utilize sidekicks, which I absolutely love. Parlaying with monsters adds a wonderful spice to being able to use alternate forms of conflict resolution with Beasts of the Wild. And lastly, there's a section of puzzles in the book. Now, this is fantastic. I'm not really that great with puzzles. It's really hard to find that sweet spot where the puzzle needs to be just difficult enough that the group feels like they accomplished something, but not impossible. With these, they not only provide you with the examples of different puzzles to use, but also hints that you can provide the players so they can get over the edge and figure it out. Now, what does this all mean? Well, all in all, I would definitely recommend picking up a copy of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Like Xanathar's before it, it's a mishmash of a bunch of different cool options that can add some variety and spice to your game. So for me, it's a definite buy. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe for new videos, share these with your friends, and tell me your thoughts on Tasha's Cauldron of Everything below. What's your favorite new subclass that you want to take out for a spin? And remember, roll dice, roll play, and roll with it.